Welcome back to another episode of the Boots on the Ground podcast. Today, we're visiting with a gal who loves community, traveling, and the world behind the lens. She's a Nebraska-based videographer and photographer whose photos have been featured on Wrangler and many more, so we'll get into that. But there's no doubt that her photos won't make you feel inspired and ready to get your hands dirty. So, without further ado, welcome to the podcast, Miss Tori Egger. I'm excited to be here. <laughs> Thank you for coming. There's no doubt that... Um, like I said, your photos haven't inspired so many and inspired me from afar since I can remember as a freshman in college. Your photos um, really have uh, impacted so many and it's so fun to see what you're going to come out with. Yay, I'm excited to talk. Okay, so you've lived in five different states. Yes. You're originally from Columbus, Nebraska. Tell us a little bit about your background. So, um... I was born in Kentucky, then we moved to Kansas, which is where my mom's from, and then we moved to Nebraska, and then to Wisconsin, and then back to Nebraska, and I'm from Columbus now, and uh, my family runs a feed yard, a cow-calf operation, and we have a bull sale march, and then we also run a show pig operation, and then my grandpa, or sorry, my dad's side of the family does cutting horses, and then my mom's side of the family does the cow-calf operation. And so I'm really surrounded with all types of agriculture within my business. So that's how I was able to learn different parts, uh, like how to photograph horses or how to photograph cattle or, you know, how to make it more authentic because I grew Mm -hmm. up in it knowing what to photograph and what's important. Right. So agriculture is obviously a really big part of who you are and where you come from. Yeah. Um, What inspired you to have those Western style photos? So... My mom bought a camera for Christmas, and I, it was a Canon Rebel T3i, very beginner camera she got at Walmart, <laughs> and she bought it so that she could take pictures of our bulls, and she's not very tech savvy, and so I told her I would figure it out, you know, how, learn how to use it, and so that's kind of how I got started getting into photography is just learning how to use that camera and being able to document, like, life on the feed yard, mm-hmm. you know, my house is literally right outside the back door is the feed yard and the cow-calf operation. So I just had so many opportunities to start taking pictures with that. And that's kind of how I got into it. And then it just led me to being able to photograph my parents' friends who were Mm -hmm. also involved in agriculture. And so then I was able to use those to advertise and then it just kept going and going from there. Right, right. So you were 15 when you picked up your first camera. And correct me if I'm wrong, you did your first wedding yeah, I was, did my first wedding when I was 15. I picked up the camera a little earlier than that, maybe like 14. And I had a best friend that did photography too. And so we kind of learned together. And he kind of taught me some things. Mm. And so he was a really big help with that. And we're still best friends now. And so we've done so many different shoots together. We've shot weddings together, all this and that. Mm. But yeah, so I shot my first wedding when I was 15. They're now divorced. So I guess that shows how <laughs> well the wedding went. I showed up with like a flag that was like made out of burlap that said just married like it was so tacky <laughs> and she was it like it was cool then though it was, yeah, well yeah but I look back and I'm like this is so bad and all my <laughs> photos were edited more like bright and airy mm. and not good bright and airy it was like she was washed out mm. and like I made her look I don't know like an off-white color instead of white yeah and they're not together anymore so she probably doesn't care about the pictures <laughs> but I do they're still on my Facebook if you want to look at them yeah Cool, cool. So you talked a little bit about editing right there. How did you find the style that you wanted? That's a good question. So I started messing around with other people's presets. Like Mm. you can buy presets from other photographers. And I also was kind of looking at other Western photographers and how they edit. Mm. And even just like back in the day, how cool it looked having it on black and white film or like the type of film photos that were moody looking in the West. It looks way cooler on a moody edit than a bright and airy. And I know some people that do like super bright and airy edits in like the show horse world and those look really pretty. But just for like documenting agriculture, I thought it looked really cool to really grab in the colors of like a corn, you know, or the grass or, you know, the orange Hereford, you know, all that kind of the red Angus, you know, all the colors. And I thought it looked best on the moody for me. So that's kind of how I figured that I wanted to edit moody. And then I just kind of was looking at other photographers work and then messing around with presets. And then finally, I just developed my own because I wasn't really mm-hmm. finding one that I liked that fit me. And so 
yeah, that's kind of how I got into that. Okay, awesome. So what has your journey been like since since 15 years old to to today? What does that look like? Because it's been about 10 years, right? Yeah, it's a little over 10 years, which is crazy. Yeah, what I has tell that journey that, been like? Um, gosh, it's been a long journey. I feel like, so I started when I was 15, and it took me at least four years to finally get everything learned. Mm. And like back in high school, it would have been back in like 2013, 2012, maybe 2011 when I started. And the internet wasn't as prevalent back then. And so like now you have so many resources with other photographers offering mentorships, just even learning from a reel on Instagram. I learned how how to do something on Photoshop the other day. Um, YouTube, you know, being able to search on YouTube. I didn't have that back then. And I took a photography class in high school and I was basically teaching the class with my friend because the the teacher didn't really care. It was a class you joined just to mess around in. And so he was having us, like, print off things to look at. Like, that's what it was back then. We had to print it off to look at it because social media wasn't so prevalent. So it took me at least, I want to say, four years of, like, getting out there and shooting and just learning and practicing myself. And I like to say that I'm self-taught because of that. And so, yeah, so for the first four years of my career, I didn't do as many paid shoots. I did some, which is why I say it's when I kind of started. But um, I was still learning and learning how to edit. And for the longest time, I didn't edit on Lightroom. I was editing on PicMonkey, which is like a website. Oh, yeah. I, I think I that. edited the wedding on that. Wow. Could you imagine <laughs> editing a wedding on PicMonkey.com <laughs> with the horrible filters? Now and we have amazing things like Adobe. Yeah. Adobe mm-hmm. Lightroom is great and Photoshop and whatever you need. But, um, yeah, so my editing style back then was super con- inconsistent, too. Like, I would edit certain photos moody. I would edit this wedding really light and airy. I did a maternity shoot, and it was, like, super blue. Mm. You know, so even then, like, my people wouldn't know what they were getting from me. Yeah. Because my editing style was so consistent. But they were paying me $25, so what do you expect? <laughs> like, going to Supercut to get your hair cut. Right, right. Anyways, um, so, yeah. That's kind of the beginning. And then I went to college in California for a couple of years. And so out there, I didn't do as many shoots either. But I would do shoots with, like, my friends and have a model for me. Because I just thought it was really cool. You know, we were in California. It's different than Nebraska. And so I did some shoots out there that turned out really cool on the beach and that kind of stuff. And then I really hit it hard when I moved back to Nebraska. And I didn't really have, like, a client base when I moved back because I was gone for so long. And so I just started doing free shoots with friends, trying to build myself up, getting my name out there. And I was posting in, like, our Platte County classifieds, like that kind of stuff, posting online, letting my friends know that I'm back. And so that's kind of how I built myself up back in Columbus. And then, um, and then I came back to Midland when I was done in California. And so I had a lot of shoots there that I did at Midland University mm-hmm. with friends, and those were all paid. And that's kind of when I started really getting back into it. Every weekend, I would have a shoot while I was in college. Mm. And so that was really stressful. I, like, I graduated college and lost so much weight, just mm. all these things. Yeah. So college was really stressful, trying to balance doing a business and being in college. But I think it's worth it. Because yeah. then when I graduated, I was able to just go directly being full-time mm. instead of having to work another job. So that really worked. And, yeah, so that's kind of where I'm at now. Like, I've been self-employed since I graduated college in 2019. Wow, that's amazing. What um, What's one piece of advice you would have for the students who um, are maybe struggling and they have a business and they're really stressed out and they're trying to graduate, but they're not sure if they want to do go full-time right after they graduate? Yeah, that's a good question. Or really for anybody who's yeah, in that space. Yeah. Can I go full-time? How would I do this? So it is kind of stressful. My roommate is trying to do go full-time with her business now. But she is still working her 9 to 5. And so she, like I'm telling her not to go full-time right away because she's not going to have any money. Mm -hmm. Like she has no clients. that She needs to build herself up. So sometimes it might work to find a job that allows you to also include photography so Mm -hmm. you can build your clients or do shoots on the weekends. But um, also I think a way to keep myself from burning out is every once in a while I do like a bucket list photo shoot. So I have all these dream shoots written down, and every once in a while, I like to cross one off and do it. And after I leave those shoots, like, I feel like a different person, like Mm -hmm. a different photographer. I feel better about myself. And I definitely deal with, like, imposter syndrome and, like, not thinking Mm -hmm. I'm that good, you know, sometimes. You know, you get that feeling. Right. And so definitely going out and doing a shoot that you've set up the way you want to with the models you want, exactly how you want it. 
you know, when there's money involved, there's more pressure sometimes. Mm -hmm. And so I really feel like that helps me get back into my groove. And I did one of those recently with my buffalo photos that I did. Um, those were so cool. Yeah, the bison photos. They're so cool. And um, that really helped me just feel really inspired to go do more of that stuff and do more prints and more cool Western shoots and all that. So that, I think that's really important when you're feeling like you're not being successful at all in your business, go out and create those opportunities. Mm -hmm. I always say that, like, don't wait for someone to book you for the shoot that you want to do. Like, why don't you just set it up yourself and do it? And then people will see that and be like, oh, she offers that. Let yeah. me do it. So then you're going to start doing it more often. Yeah. So if you're setting up shoots that you like to do and you're posting them on your social media, you're going to be getting booked for those kind of shoots. Mm -hmm. So I guess that's a good way to build your clientele, build your business to a way where you're doing shoots that you love to do. And you're not stuck doing weddings or doing something just to make money because that's not why you should start your business in the first place. And if you're only doing something for the money, you're not going to enjoy it. Mm. So, yeah, that's kind of my advice of getting yourself going with your business in a way you want to run right. your business. Right. No, that's awesome. I think it's um, sometimes it's hard because a lot of people will they work or they they do things for the money. And that's why I came to Angler was because I said, I want to work with people who are so excited to do what they do and yeah. so passionate about building something that matters. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, and I think as in entrepreneurship, it's, it's different because we're building something that we truly, truly care about and we're not yeah. in it for the money. Oh, yes. Yeah. Talk, um, talk about a time where the going got rough and it got tough and um, you you had to regroup and you had to maybe rethink things as Ooh. an entrepreneur in your business. Yes. This was last year. Or no, it was 2021. Um, I was like up until 2021 with my business, I wasn't really thinking about the business side of things because I'm a photographer. I like art. I was never good at math in high school. Someone else does my taxes for me for a reason. And so I wasn't really taking the business side seriously. And it came to like, it was February, I think. And I was in my friend's car, sad, because I only had $300 in my bank mm -hmm. account. Like, that was it. I'm like, I have bills to pay, you know. And he yelled at me. He's like, you need to raise your prices. You need to do this. You need to do that. Like, giving me all this advice. He's a really great videographer. He works more in the corporate world. So mm -hmm. he's charging like $7,000 for one client because it's corporate stuff with what he's doing. And he was like, you need to raise your pricing. Like, just learning how to charge my worth was really hard for me for the yeah. longest time, and I applied a lot of stress with money, so, or a lot of pressure with money, so, like, when someone would pay me $2,000 for a shoot, I would be like, oh, this has to be perfect, and they're already booking me for stuff that they've already seen me do, like, they like what I do already, so they think that's good enough or, like, perfect for what they want, but I felt like I had to go the extra mile, so I would stay longer at the shoot, or I would deliver extra images all that kind of stuff that I maybe should have charged more for or that kind of stuff. Like I've always, I was a people pleaser for the longest time and now I'm posting these sassy quotes on Instagram because I can care less. <laughs> like I, I mean, I please my clients mm -hmm. as much as I can, but there's only to a certain point you have to right. stand up for yourself. And so I'd let people walk all over me being able, like when I would do a family shoot and their kid would cry the whole time, I'd be like, oh, let's redo it. I'm mm -hmm. so sorry your kid cried, but it's not my fault your kid cried, you yeah, know, like right. that kind of stuff that, um, yeah, so definitely the business side of things I struggle, struggled with for the longest time and just figuring out what to charge. Yeah, and how even, did you figure that out? Um, so really just asking other photographer friends, mm -hmm. like, what they charge. And I have a friend who's, like, connected. He did a shoot for Nike. He's done wow. stuff with, like, other different corporate companies. He's, like, my one of my best friends. And so he was really good at, like, oh, this is what my friend said we should be doing. Or he's talked to different people. And then I've also talked to other people kind of comparing. Mm -hmm. And so that's why it's great to build yourself a community of other photographers. And, like, they get something from me, too. I'm not just taking from them. Like, we talk, discuss things back and forth with our businesses. So that's really helpful because some, some of these people know more than I do about that kind of stuff yeah. and what to charge. And also just doing your cost of doing business, too, taking in all the gear, all the softwares that you pay for, the gas, the car wear and tear, you know, and all your bills, you kind of, I had to sit down and write all that out mm -hmm. and really take into account of like, what am I spending on my business? What are my expenses and how am I going to cover them and cover all my bills and 
retirement, all that kind of stuff mm-hmm. that comes into running a business. So yeah, that's kind of how I figured it out. You know, as another creative, I can totally resonate with you on feeling like it's so hard to charge what you're worth. Yes. Yeah. I struggle so hard with that. I was recently trying to figure out how to charge something for these monthly shoots that I want to offer where they're going to book me for a whole year. And I sent the price to my friend and he called me. He's like, change it. It's like, you need to go up. I was only going to charge like 250 a month mm. and that would never, not even be worth it. Right. Like that would not cover my gas or anything to do these kinds of shoots. Mm-hmm. And so even now I still struggle with it, but I know who to ask. Mm-hmm. Like I know who's going to tell me, hey, like fix this. Yeah. And so, yeah. How important um, as a business owner is it to have someone like that in your life? I think it's so important. coaching you. Yeah. Like you need, no matter what stage in life you are, some people look up to me and they're like, wow, she's my inspiring photographer. I'm like, that's great. Don't, mm -mm, don't do that to me. (laughs) Like, I don't want that pressure. Yeah. But, um, yeah, like never think you're the best Mm. because you can always learn from other people. And, like, I did a shoot with a girl who was just starting out, and she taught me things. And I was like, that's amazing. Like, she, she's just learning and has already learned these few things that are now I'm taking into my business Mm -hmm. and that kind of stuff. So, yeah, just never think you're the best. Don't be arrogant. And, yeah, I do think it's really important to have those people in your life. And so if you're arrogant and thinking you're the best, no one's going to want to be your friend. Mm -hmm. And so that's how you get those kinds of people in your life, too. Yeah. Yeah. What's, um, tell us about a time when, uh, it was, business was just so good and you were thriving and what that feeling was like. Last year I started charging my worth. And so business was really thriving financially and like getting new clients. I started blowing up on social media Mm. a little more last year. Um, on TikTok last year, I gained 40,000 followers Wow! in one year. I was like, I measured it. I took a screenshot at the beginning of the year and I had like a thousand followers. That was it. And I would post on TikTok and get five likes on a video. Yeah. And I gave up on TikTok for a while because I was like, this sucks. (laughs) Like I can't keep posting on here and getting five likes and then posting on Instagram and getting 500. Yep. You know? And so I gave up on it and I shouldn't have. But then I was like, you know what? I'm going to go back on TikTok and try it again. And I posted a video and it got 50 likes and that was enough for me to keep (laughs) going. And then I got 500 likes on a video and I was like, oh, this is great. And so I kept posting and posting, and then I had one really blow up, and uh, that brought me a lot of followers, and then just videos here and there just keep blowing up, you know, which is really cool. And that brought me five new clients for my family sessions in October. They, I have on my website, they can tell me where they found me. And I've had multiple people say, I found you from TikTok. Wow. Which is crazy. Like, I just had a girl reach out to me from Oregon to do her senior photos, and she found me on TikTok. And what I love about TikTok is, like, on your For You page, you're seeing the stuff that you like to watch. Mm -hmm. So I know that people who like Western photography or, like, Western fashion are seeing my videos. Like, Mm -hmm. the right kind of people are seeing my videos. I'm going off on a tangent. No, this is um, great. It's good advice. Like, get on TikTok. I keep telling people that. (laughs) If you guys remember Vine, do you guys remember? Oh, absolutely. I'm sad at everyone away. (laughs) I was a Vine. I want to find my old Vines. Anyways, um, I used to just think it was just like a silly app that you post your funny Mm -hmm. videos. You know, I never thought of it as a business aspect, but it's been so great to post on there and then have clients from it. Like I'm actually, Mm -hmm. that's what makes it worth it. Not even having all the followers or all the likes It's actually getting clients from it Yeah, is what makes it really cool. And so that was like my whole social media last year. And I started doing my quote posts last year and those started blowing up really big. And I got into videography last year. So that was also, a big change in my business too. There was a lot of great things that happened last year that just helped me really build my business. Yeah. And adding videography was really good too because now I'm booked up with videography shoots or I can do more shoots with bigger companies that want both video and photo. Mm-hmm. You mm-hmm. know, there was companies that would reach out to me beforehand and I'm like, oh, I don't do video. They're like, oh, we're going to go find someone that does both. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, that was, last year was a really big year for yeah. my business. Cool. I think you need, every entrepreneur needs those really exciting moments just to keep going. So yeah, that's awesome. Um, you mentioned the quotes and this is something that I wrote down that I want to ask you about because um, your quotes have really made an impact on your social media, I mm-hmm. think. And especially putting yourself out there as an entrepreneur is kind of hard. So one quote I want to talk about is um, you wrote, 
If you are going to do big things, you cannot let small things get to you. I feel like in entrepreneurship or as you're putting yourself out there as a person, Mm -hmm. you know, I resonate with this so much because I'm, I'm guilty of, you know, letting those small mistakes get to me. But how do you as an entrepreneur and a photographer, um, how do you, how do you handle that? And what advice do you have for someone who might be feeling a pit in their stomach because they made a mistake from a a customer experience or a bad review? What advice do you have on that? Um, let's see. So I really think, I mean, it's important to not let it get to you. It's just one person. And like, if you're able to make it up somehow, that's really important too. Like if I were to make a mistake at a shoot, I would either refund them some of the money or we could redo the shoot Mm -hmm. or, you know, I would do something to make it up. So that would make me feel better. And I mean, I don't want to scam people. So if I'm Mm -hmm. providing them stuff that they didn't like, I want to make sure I make it right. And then kind of just letting it go, like learn using it as a learning experience. Mm -hmm. Every time I fail, I, you know, sit down and think about it. Like what could I have done differently? Then I'm like, okay, so next time I have a shoot like this, I need to do this, this, and this, and that'll fix what I need to do. Mm -hmm. So kind of also just taking it as a learning experience instead of a failure. You never really fail. You just, you either learn Mm -hmm. and whatnot. And so, yeah, taking it as a learning experience kind of helps too, like switching your mindset and then just being able to kind of fix the problem as best as you can and making the client happy. But um, that's about all I can think of. Yeah. And I also kind of, with that quote, was also meeting more like small-minded people in my Mm. hometown who were like, oh, you can't go to California and go to school. You can't. My parents for the longest time were like, oh, are you going to get a real job? They would say that, like expecting me to get a nine-to-five job. And I think now that I've showed them my tax forms and like (laughs) that I'm paying bills and like making an income and doing all these cool things, Mm -hmm. they're more, they're really more supportive. But for the longest time, there's not a lot of entrepreneur people in my hometown, I feel like, or at least in my family's circle. They all work nine to five jobs or they work, you know, as cattle ranchers and it's like a 24 seven job. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what my parents were kind of expecting for me is to have more of that stability. Mm -hmm. And um, like I can create my own schedule too. So I'm up at like 3 a.m. editing because I'm a night owl. And my parents are the kind of people that are up at 6 a.m. every day to do chores and just go about their day. And I would sleep in, and that would drive them nuts when I lived with them because I had to be on their schedule and do what they do. But as an entrepreneur and running your own business, you don't have to. Like, you can do it the way you want, and that's the joy of it. I'm a night owl. I thrive better at night, so that's how I'm going to do it. Yeah. And so, yeah. I I appreciate you taking that spin on it because I had no idea that's what you actually had meant in that post. Just don't listen to small-minded people. Yeah. Um, You know, obviously take their advice and listen to it. But you don't have to act on it. Mm -hmm. You can, if you think it's good advice, then act on it. But just listen to it and then be like, no. Like, I want to take my own path and do my own thing. And I think that's really important. Yeah. Another quote that I love that you wrote is, how your life feels is more important than how it looks. Yes. Where did that come from? It came from... um, I'm not exactly sure. Well, I found it on Pinterest, but like the mindset of the quote, it's just being on social media Mm -hmm. and seeing people who live these lavish lifestyles. And then also um, there's a gal in my town that likes to spend more money than she makes. And she buys all these extravagant cars Mm -hmm. and boats. And my mom used to work at the bank and she's like, I know this woman. She doesn't have, has no problem racking up $30,000 on a credit card, you know, like that kind of stuff. And that would drive, that would, oh, that would drive me nuts. And so she's trying to make her life look good, but I can feel behind the scenes it's probably a little stressful financially. Mm -hmm. And you don't have to have the nicest things. You don't have to have, you know, the nicest lifestyle or whatever. Mm -hmm. And even now, like, the type of money I make, like, I don't expect to buy a super huge house or a mansion, and I'm okay with that. Like, I'm okay living in my apartment. I'm okay, you know, driving just a simple car, like that kind of stuff. I don't have to have the next Chanel bag. I care less about, you know, designer fashion. Mm -hmm. And it's okay if you do care about that stuff and you can afford it. But um, I don't know. You just don't have to make your life look good. Right. You need to make it feel good. And that'll make you happier. And mental health is so important. And so financial stress can cause a lot of mental health issues for people and stuff. So, yeah. Yeah, for sure. Sometimes... uh, 
people overlook that kind of stuff and mm-hmm. uh, don't look at what's in front of them. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. I appreciate hearing that. Um, one thing that you kind of talked about with 2023 is that everyone has a seat at your table. Uh-huh. Um, here in Angler, I'm sure you kind of sense the community and, and being around the space and the students that there's power in connections and having like-minded people around you. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think it gives you courage and it gives, it gives me confidence to keep going and keep driving. What does community look like for you? And why is 2023, everyone has a seat at my table, your, um, your, your mantra? I think it's become my mantra because I just see so much hate on social media. Mm-hmm. Um, there's so much divide, you know, with religion or politics or whatever, you know, like I don't care about any of that, like what you believe in or what you voted for. Like I'm still going to be friends with you. Mm -hmm. And I just see so many relationships getting torn apart because of that kind of stuff. And just because of so much hate on social media. And so I'm trying to show people that I accept everyone at my table. And like, I have a bunch of friends that are gay. I have a bunch of friends that are hardcore Catholic I have friends that voted for this person or that person, and I'm still friends with them. Mm -hmm. You know, like, I don't have to stop being friends with someone because they believe in this or that. Like, obviously, if they're believing in something like, I don't know, something really, really controversial, like Mm -hmm. being a Nazi or, you know, something like like those type things, then I'm going to be like, oh, I'm not supporting this. Mm -hmm. But, like, just other typical things that are happening in our world, whether you support it or not. So that's become a big deal in my life just kind of accepting everyone at my table. And also, a lot of photographers like to gatekeep. Mm -hmm. And I had a photographer recently reach out to me asking about a location in Omaha. And I told him exactly where it was. And I said it would be great for your business. And he somehow found my Venmo and Venmo me $10 for telling him the location. Because he felt the need to because I was so open to Mm -hmm. tell him about a location. Or I get people who are like, thank you for even responding. Yeah. Because a lot of photographers don't respond because they want to gatekeep. And, um, yeah, I just feel like you're not the only person to use this location. You're not the only person to know how to do this type of editing or type of use this camera or whatever, you know. And so I think it's you should just be open about what you do. And if you're mm-hmm. worried about people coming in and stealing your business or doing better than you, then you're doing it for the wrong reasons. Mm -hmm. Like you're comparing yourself to other people, you're getting jealous, you know, you're getting hateful, that kind of stuff. And so I really think community is so important. And like I said earlier about just having other photographers to talk to and bounce ideas off to, or, oh, does this edit look too orange? Or how did you do this? You know, that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. And being able to reach out to those people who will actually answer. And then also they learn something from you So that makes me feel better, too, that I'm giving them something. Mm -hmm. And so that's the whole everyone has a seat at my table kind of mantra. Yeah, no, I love that. I love that. How do you, um, what advice do you have for entrepreneurs out there who maybe struggle to find community in in such a state where, you know, we live (laughs) 50 miles apart from or away from Omaha or or Mm -hmm. Lincoln or Mm -hmm. even way further than that? How do you inspire um, other entrepreneurs, or what advice do you have on finding community? Hmm. So I think social media has also kind of built a community for me too. Mm. Like I have a friend from Utah that I'm, I've am i never met, but we're like online besties. That's what mm. we call each other. And we talk all the time. And um, you can still build a community of people to reach out to on social media as well. And then even if you just find one person in your area, that, like, you're willing to, like, be friends with and, like, work with and build yourselves together, like, that's really helpful, too. I'm sure, you know, anywhere you look, there's a photographer in your area, or at least within an hour from you that you can Mm -hmm. meet up with. And so it doesn't have to be, like, a lot of people in your circle. I'm the kind of person that doesn't really care to be friends with everyone because that leads you to be friends with people who would just use you. Mm -hmm. You know, I have kind of a smaller friend group of, like, non-photographers, like, just people that I grew up with. And then, like, I have a sister who has been friends with everyone, and she's, Mm -hmm. you know, not friends with the same people that she used to be. Mm -hmm. Or, like, she doesn't have that friend that's been friends with her since junior high, like I have, that kind of stuff. And so it's about finding the good people in your life that aren't going to – and I've definitely been around people that I've noticed only use me for my knowledge. Mm -hmm. Like, I would give them all this stuff. We would talk all the time, and now we don't talk that much. So it's kind of like, oh, I see your intentions. That's hard. So 
So it is hard to like build that community and, you know, sometimes you might find people who will use you mm. and stuff, but don't let those people stop you from finding that community because there are good people out there that just want to be your friend mm -hmm. or like you both will be able to give something to each other. And it might help finding someone that's maybe on your level too. You know, it's hard sometimes for me to talk to beginner photographers because all they want to do is just learn from me. I'm like, I want to be your friend. Like, let's go thrifting together or something, yeah. you know, like that kind of stuff. I'd rather be like actual friends with the photographers that I meet than just like business friends. You know what mm -hmm. I mean? Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I think that's really helpful in finding community. It's just finding at least one person in your area yeah. to be friends with. And then they could lead you to other people or other creatives. And yeah. Okay. So you, uh, oh, first off, Thank you for sharing that because it's hard to kind of share those hard things and those yeah. real and raw. Uh -huh. um, and I can totally see that on your social and just who you are as a person. So thank you for being authentic. Yeah. Because sometimes that's really hard to find. Mm -hmm. um, so back to uh, how you were kind of talking about how the businesses would ask you if you do video, but you don't do video. Mm -hmm. um, you have now incorporated video into your business. When did that start and why? So I started in, I think, February of last year. And I started it because I wanted to start showing the behind the scenes of my photo shoots. And I wanted to start getting into posting more on TikTok and Reels. And I I don't like the tacky Reels that photographers do. <laughs> like the ones where they're like, this is my age. This is the camera I shoot with. Mm. Or they're like, me at a shoot. Ha -ha. And they're like doing a voiceover. I don't like them. I'm being blunt here. <laughs> I, I can't stand them. They're really cheesy. And um, it's okay if you do them. Like, if they're getting you views, like, keep doing it. But I scroll past them. Anyway, so I wasn't really posting any reels or TikTok at the time because I just didn't have the content. I was not going to stand in front of the camera and do that and shake my camera and be like, my clients are the best, you know. I, so I just started um, getting into video for that, too, so I could start posting reels because I realized that, like, Instagram and TikTok were kind of all about that mm -hmm. at the time. And yeah, and I wanted to show the behind the scenes. And then I just started posting, you know, the behind the scenes, my video work and all that. And then people started booking me for it. Mm. And so, yeah, that's kind of led me. That's what led me to get into it. And my best friend does videography, too. So I was able to ask him, like, how to get into it and what are the right steps to take in the beginning. Mm. I think it helped that I already knew photography. Like, it was a lot easier to learn videography because I already knew the camera that kind of stuff and there's some things that kind of crisscross between photography and videography and whatnot but yeah that's kind of how I got it started yeah what do you enjoy shooting most um I do like the ranch lifestyle stuff like the mm -hmm. western lifestyle and western fashion those are my two favorites but um yeah those are really fun they're really creative you can kind of do whatever you want with them and even like the ranch lifestyle it can kind of be easy because I like to make them authentic, so I'm usually just following someone around on their mm -hmm. work day. Or, you know, I'm telling them to set up something that goes along with whatever type of shoot we're doing right. for that day. And so that kind of helps growing up in that industry, knowing like, oh, you should kneel down to this calf and like act like you're tagging it. Mm -hmm. You know, like if you've never been around calving season, you're not going to know that that's the thing. So, yeah, I think those are some of my favorite things. And just getting to work with like Western brands through those things are really cool, too. Yeah. And so that's kind of, um, I got out of weddings and those were kind of the things that, um, paid the same amount as the wedding. Mm. So like income wise, I was able to kind of match up and those are like something I love way more than doing weddings. So I just feel happier, more, you know, mental health, all that kind of stuff is so better when I do those kinds of shoots. I bet it was a huge relief not having to go to weddings yes. all the time. I'm not going to a wedding again. I don't care who gets <laughs> married. I'm not going. If it's my brother, I'm not showing up. No, I'm kidding. Funny story. I totally asked um, Tori to do my wedding oh, yeah. about a year and a half ago, and I was so bummed when you said you didn't do weddings anymore. Yes. <laughs> but last, I totally get it. The last wedding I ever shot, he ripped up, one of the groomsmen, like, ripped up the sheet that I had that was, like, the list of all the family members that needed pictures. He was just so hot-headed. And, like, people were coming up to the bride, like, you should get a picture with Cousin Tom. No. And I'm like, if it's on the list, we'll get to it. And I was like, you know, this is a great way to end yeah. a wedding. I'm glad this happened because I right. never want to do it again. Right. But I felt so bad for the bride because they were just coming. It was a, kind of a bigger family, so there's mm -hmm. a lot of people. And people just come, kept coming up to her left and right. 
you should get a picture with this person, this person. And I could tell she was annoyed. Mm -hmm. And yeah. It's a stressful day. Not only for the bride, but for the photographer too. Yes. And it doesn't help. You know, you can meet up with a a bride and groom at a coffee shop, but they're going to be different when they're at their wedding day under Mm -hmm. a lot of pressure and stress. And that's why I recommend eloping. Just go stand on a mountain (laughs) and do it. Just go elope. The pictures look way cooler. Just invite your mom and dad and call it a day. Yep. You know, go to the bar after and have a drink. That's it. Right. Don't put so much stress on your wedding day. Right. But yeah, people can act differently when they're under stress. And that's kind of what happened a lot too. Mm -hmm. Or they drink a lot and they're drunk. Yeah. Yeah. And then you can tell in the pictures or they just weren't as cooperative because Mm -hmm. they were drunk, you know? Yep. Yep. Yeah. Um, back to how you kind of started or talked about how you like shooting Western style. Mm-hmm. Um, you said uh, cl- like clothing and like jewelry and stuff like that. Uh, you were featured on Wrangler. Where else were you all featured? You said Pendleton. Yes. Yeah, so I had a friend. You might know him, Taylor Lineman. Do you know him? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I did a photo shoot with him, and this was not too long after his dad passed away. Yeah. And his dad loved Pendleton whiskey. So he had just a bunch of Pendleton bottles. And I was like, okay, let's do a shoot with, like, Pendleton bottles. And so I did, like, a photo of him on his horse, like, holding the bottle. And made it kind of super moody. So then you just see the bottle and, like, he's kind of, like, darker. And Pendleton really loved it. So they um, purchased the image from me. Wow. For their own social media and stuff like that. So that was really cool. And that's kind of also what happened with Wrangler, too. Like, I did a photo shoot um, in Texas at the Fort Worth Stockyards, Mm -hmm. and I was just doing it with some friends, and it was during, like, the semifinals of the Americans, so there was a bunch of hot cowboys driving by. (laughs) I wanted to include them. One of them shouted their number at my friend, and we didn't get it, and so we spent the whole day trying to figure out who he was. Darn. (laughs) Anyways, they also purchased images from me, so that's kind of how I got connected with Wrangler, which is really cool. So sometimes, like, just setting up those shoots of, like, products that you want to work with, companies that you want to work with, maybe using their product. Like, I didn't have to spend money buying the product because the people already had it. So if you Mm -hmm. find someone that likes to drink, maybe they already have Pendleton whiskey. Mm -hmm. Or if you find someone who wears Wrangler, just have them dressed in all Wrangler. And then Wrangler might see it. Yeah. And then they might purchase it from you or share it, you know, whatever. Mm -hmm. And so that's really cool. And that's kind of another point of, like, setting up the shoots that you Mm want to do that can also lead you to those businesses. Right. You just so did you just tag them in those photos and then they saw it? Is that yeah, how it yeah, worked? Yeah. Yeah. So I put it on my social media, which I guess it might help that I had a lot of people sharing it mm-hmm. and a lot of people liking it. And so they saw it. But yeah, that's basically all I did was just tag them in it. And then they wow. shared it and were like, "Can we buy this image?" Wow. So that was really cool. And then I was on like their front website page for Wrangler. Wow. Which is so cool. And they like put my name on it. So that was cool. That's crazy. I don't know how many people click their website, but every person that day saw my picture. Yeah. No, that's awesome. That's so cool. What an accomplishment. Yeah. So So stuff like that. Stuff like that is really what keeps me going too. Mm -hmm. Like when just little things like that that happen that were kind of unexpected. Yeah. Yeah. So you, uh, I love seeing how you go to Texas, Arizona, and a couple other states. What has traveling done like? Has it opened a new perspective for you, for you and your business? Yes. So growing up on the cattle operation, we only went on like two family vacations Mm -hmm. because you cannot leave when you have cows. It's like having a million different little kids. (laughs) And so... I didn't grow up traveling as much. My dad's from Indiana. My mom's from Kansas. So I would travel to Indiana and Kansas. And the only times I would ever travel elsewise would be to cattle shows. So we went to, like, the North American, the Denver Stock Show, the the American Royal, all the majors. Mm -hmm. We did all those. But it was still involved with just cattle. So we were in the barns the whole time. Or we were with show pigs, you know, in the barns. And we would leave late at night. So you didn't really get to explore the cities that you went to. And then I moved to California for college. Like, it was, I got booted off a plane at 19. My mom's like, here you go. Like, don't call me to help you because you're 24 hours away, Mm -hmm. you know? And that is really what inspired me to get out and travel more. Just being out there really opened my eyes to how different life is in different places. You know, growing up in a small-minded, small-town Columbus, Mm. I was able to, you know, go to California and meet all types of different races, different cultures, you know, different ways that people live. And I wouldn't say I'm going to move back to California anytime soon. It's a little hectic 
too many people and too expensive. But um, yeah, that's kind of what led me to want to go to all these these different places. Yeah. And, yeah. and then I started um, just going on my own trips. And I would set up a shoot while I was on these trips just for myself to have on social media to say, oh, I did a shoot in Arizona. Like, if you ever want me to come back to Arizona for a photo shoot, I will. Mm -hmm. And so that kind of helped that I was already planning to go on this trip and just turned it into content. Or I would take a picture of a mountain and be like, I'm here in Mm -hmm. Colorado, you know, if you want to do a shoot. And so now I get booked all the time to go different places, different states. Mm, that's awesome. Yeah. Okay, I have a really authentic question. When you eat, when you get those um, type of shoots booked, do they pay for your travel or do you pay for that travel yourself? So they pay for my travel. Okay. They'll, they'll pay for my plane ticket or gas and a hotel. Okay, I was really curious how yeah, that actually yeah. worked and yeah. what the reality of it was. <laughs> I usually, yeah, I try to ta- tie that in. I know some people that shoot elopements, they just have them pay for the travel mm. sometimes, and they're not really making as much money off of it. I think it just looks cool for them. But for me, like, I have to make the money off of it. Yeah. Because it's a lot to travel. And, you know, plane tickets, gas, that all adds up, food and whatnot. And so I'm very fortunate that people are willing to pay for travel and for the shoot. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, so I have more of another kind of personal question. Um I remember back when, because I'm also a creative, I do singing and Mm -hmm. different things like that. I remember when I had to really put myself out there and actually charge what I was being worth. And it was someone that was very personal to me and that um, it was a classmate. And I couldn't do their wedding because it was too, I was too expensive. Oh, yes. So how do you deal with those people that you really, really care about? But the reality is, is that they can't afford that. Yeah. Well, I think the people that I really, really care about, like my small friend group, like I'll just do a shoot for them for like a discounted price because mm-hmm. they're, you know, my best friends. Or right. if it's a family member, it's usually free because they're a family. They're not going to pay me. They should, but they don't. <laughs> it's okay. Um, but yeah, I've had people reach out to me that like were people I went to college with or people that I know personally. And they're like, oh, we can't afford that. And I'm like, oh, that's okay. Like, we're just not going to do the shoot, you know? Like, I don't say it like that. I say it in a nicer way. Like, oh, that's fine. If you can't fit my budget, I might refer them to someone else who might fit their budget Mm -hmm. and whatnot. But I guess I don't really feel bad about not doing the shoot for them, even though they're someone I know. Mm -hmm. Because if they can't afford me, they can't afford me. And if they're really your friend, like, they're either, like, they genuinely can't afford you or they're going to pay your price, what you charge, you know, that kind of stuff. So I never feel bad. I'm not like, oh, they can't. They're not going to pay me to do this. Like, I hate them now, you know? Right. Like, I never feel that way either. Right. I just know, like, oh, they they just have a small budget. That's it. Mm-hmm. So I guess I don't really let it affect me. And eventually, they could do a shoot with me in the future if they have more money or finance, finances go better or something, you know? Mm-hmm. So, mm-hmm. yeah. Yeah. Okay, so where are you at in your journey today? And um, I don't want to ask you, like, what the next five, ten years looks like, but what's the next chapter look like for you? Well, I'm trying to focus more on my Western fashion, Western lifestyle stuff. Mm -hmm. And so that's why I'm trying to offer these monthly shoots with different Western businesses where they can book me for the whole year and I do a shoot with them every month. So then they have content for each month. And um, I think that's really something I want to get more into and even more corporate work too. But the thing is with certain corporate companies, they put you in a box they're, you have an idea, and they're like, oh, we can't do that. It doesn't fit our professional box or mm-hmm. whatever. And so if I have a company that reaches out to me about doing a shoot, and they won't let me have creative freedom, sometimes I'll be like, you know, this isn't going to work out. Mm-hmm. I don't think this will work for me. Because I do best when I kind of have some creative freedom and can bring the idea. I obviously take other people's ideas and kind of put them into the shoot, but Sometimes when corporate companies get involved, they're like, it has Mm. to be done like this. It has to be in this box. And that's also why I like running my own business. You know, if I was working Mm -hmm. for a corporate company doing photography, I'd have to do it on their their terms and in their box. And so, yeah, just having that creative freedom when you come to shoots is really important too. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, So we have have an audience in the room for those who aren't listening, but... um, What advice do you have for the young students sitting in this room that are either just dabbling with a camera or working on their camera or the photography businesses? 
So I recently heard this on a podcast, and it says the best kind of camera you can buy is one that you can afford to replace. And what I mean by that is if you're going to go buy the super expensive camera that you can't afford to replace, you're going to hold yourself back from doing all these really cool shoots. Mm. You know, the other day I was doing a shoot around calving season, and I was literally laying in the snow with my camera in the snow and probably some cow poop in the area, like clicking it, you know? And if I had a high dollar fancy camera, I wouldn't be doing that. Mm. But like the shots that I got doing that were really cool. Or, you know, I've dropped my camera several times and it's never broken. So get a Canon camera. <laughs> but um, like I've climbed mountains with my camera. You know, I've done all these cool opportunities with my camera. And if I had a high dollar camera, then I would hold myself back, I feel like. Mm. So yeah, the best kind of camera is one that you can afford to replace. And I thought that was genius. Mm. Like that changed my whole mindset. I want to tell everyone that message. Yeah, for sure. Um, what advice do you have for young videographers and photographers who are just starting? Hmm. Ooh. So the best advice I would give is to just get out there and shoot. It's the best way to learn your camera and set up shoots that are maybe super discounted or even free, which is people that you know or whoever you want to work with. So you can make those mistakes and not have any financial pressure or an actual client pressure. And you can look back on the shoot and be like, how could I have done this differently? And you can sit there and analyze it. That's like the best way. A lot of the things that I've learned in life were from mm -hmm. mistakes that I made. So I always tell people to make mistakes. And the best way to do it, make those mistakes is, you know, when you're first starting out, no financial stress, all that kind of stuff, no pressure. You can make those mistakes. And then you can also set the tone of what kind of business you want to do. So if you're starting out taking pictures of cattle in Western fashion, people are going to know that, oh, you're trying to be a Western photographer. Mm -hmm. You're trying to shoot Western fashion. You're trying to shoot livestock sales or shows, you know. So just start doing what you want to do. Don't start things that are going to make you money. You know, yeah. people start doing weddings because they think that's how you're going to make money. And you can make money doing it other ways and doing the things that you love to do. And there's a lot of people that get stuck into doing weddings or family photos or stuff that they don't like to do because that's the way they thought they had to start. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Yeah. No, I appreciate hearing that too because um, entrepreneurs, I mean, everywhere struggle with um, how do I start? Mm -hmm. How do I start? And something we tell our students is just start. Yeah. Just start, start. somewhere. And and once you do, it'll be so worth it. Yeah. It'll be so worth it. So, um I could sit here all day and ask you questions because um, I've just truly enjoyed watching you from afar and grow your business and your your social platform. So before we wrap it up today, um, I want to talk a little bit about your platform and where you plan to go with it and how that's benefited your journey. Yeah, so I think I've always been inspired by a guy named Peter McKinnon, and he has really built himself on YouTube. And he does like tutorials. He's taught people how to do photography all that kind of stuff. And it's just free. Like you can watch it on YouTube oh. and I've learned so much from him. And so I really want to get to that point where I can build my platform to be more educational to where I don't even have to have people pay me to mentor, you know, that kind of stuff. Mm. Like I have to do it now because I'm having to take time out of my day to do these mentorships. And like, I'm, if I were to do them for free, I wouldn't get anything out of it. Mm -hmm. Or I guess I financially, like I would be taking a day that could be a shoot day, you know? And so I really want to build myself there and also becoming more of an influencer, but with like photography gear, mm -hmm. like telling people, oh, you should buy this camera. Like, here's the specs. Here's what, you know, that kind of stuff. And then maybe having like Canon send me gear mm -hmm. and they're like, do a shoot with this and like tell people about it. You know, that would be really cool. And that's kind of what this Peter McKinnon guy does. Yeah. He gets all this gear sent to him by the companies and then just promotes it and tells people why he likes it. And he does shoots with it and shows like, what he's doing with the actual equipment and how it looks. Yeah. And so I really like that. So I think becoming more influential with that kind of stuff and even just topics that I'm really into mm. or like passionate about, about people paying their content creators, all that kind of stuff. Mm. And, you know, these all these businesses reach out and they're like, oh, let's do a collaboration. We'll send you this shirt that we paid this little amount of money for and have racked up the price, you know, to yep. sell it. And I'm like, no. You either pay me or we're not doing it, you know? Right, right. So, yeah, I think I just want to become more influential with that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. And just, yeah, keep growing so that I can start giving more free knowledge. 
Yeah, I people. can see that through your authenticity all over your platform. So thank you for that. I know I said it already, but oh. it's seriously, it's um, it's inspiring to see because thank a you. lot of people do things for what what we say, the clout or the yeah. the, yeah. the followers and They're the like wrong fake. intentions. They're faked on social media. Right. And, and I, I, I've definitely met photographers that are a different way on social media than they are in person too. Mm. So mm. I know how that goes. Yeah. So do I you to, work with a lot of people that are kind of like that, you think? Um, there's only been a couple people mm. that are kind of different. They are on social media like, hey, guys, what's up? And then you meet them. They're like, hey, what's up? You know, they're very mm. bland. I don't know. You can tell they're kind of fake on social media. They use the high-pitched voice or, you know, yeah. they just try to be all positive And then they mm. complain the whole time to me about clients or something like that. Mm. So yeah. those are the kind of people I don't want to surround myself with. But still, everyone's welcome at my table. Right. So they can sit down. Cool. Okay, so before we end the podcast, um, I I want to want the angler community and the entrepreneurial community around Nebraska and beyond to be able to support you. So today, how can we support you as an entrepreneur and where you are at in your journey? Um, I think you can just follow me on social media and share my posts. You know, you don't have to pay pay for a shoot or anything like that. Mm-hmm. You know, just helping me build my social media is really important. And yeah. Cool, cool. Well, thank you for joining today. I've gotten to know you so much and I appreciate it because I've, like I said, followed you from afar and I love seeing your work and I know the state does too. It's showing in your amount of followers and your platform and everything like that. Mm -hmm. So if you haven't checked out Tori, go check out her website, book her for a session if you can. Mm -hmm. And uh, she's doing amazing things. So give her some love and support. Thank you. Thank you, Tori.